Welcome to Julie Mango TV. My name is Rachel Osborne, and today I am chatting with multidisciplinary visual artist Kiara Amaya Gopi about her short film entry into this year's Third Horizon Film Festival. Artifact number three, Terra Nullius, visualizes how personhood, family, and intimacy are influenced by lineages of trauma and spirituality within diasporic Caribbean identity. So, Thank you so much for joining me, Kiara. We're just going to hop right into the convo. Yeah, thanks for having and me. No problem. Okay, so can you talk a bit about your approach to your artistry? Mm -hmm. So for me, um, I come from a photography background, actually, initially, when I was in Trinidad. I used to work as a photojournalist for the um, Trinidad Guardian. And so a lot of my practice is lens-based and comes from there. Um, I like to do video, photos, um, anything that requires some sort of um, mirroring or some sort of recording, um, something that allows for refraction of the self. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I feel like I, that's about it on that. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Alrighty. Um, and then in terms of topics, yeah, no. Um, so basically in my practice, I tend to focus on um, violence as it occurs in the Anglophone Caribbean in particular. So I'm looking at violence through mostly like lens based work. Um, but um, when I talk about violence, people are often like, oh, violence, that's a that's a heavy thing. But it's also like I think about violence as the singular event that is happening, but also as its reverberations over time. So I think about what causes violence and what but what comes after violence often and wondering if in some cases violence could be like a generative act in some places. So, yeah. yeah. I get that because <laughs> I definitely think that in some situations it is and we don't even notice at mm -hmm. times so it is something to be studied. Um, so for artifact number three is actually the third in a series. Mm -hmm. So before we dive into the specific piece, could you talk about the first two installments? Yeah. So the first two installments of this series, um, one is the first one is focused on my mother and the second one is focused on my grandmother. So it's supposed to be a trilogy through our like line. Okay. Um, so the, and the last one is about me trying to determine which direction I should go in terms of um, coming into myself and reckoning with what was passed on to me and what wasn't passed on to me rather. Um, so the first two, the first one covers like my mom, her traveling from Trinidad to um, Miami and how, you know, her travel documents were stolen and her navigating that afterwards and thinking about like her, her position in society, both societies and in Trinidad as in America, thinking about them as um, her being in a liminal space as a woman, as a, married person who requires um the husband's signature to get a new passport even um how she is kind of stuck in the limbo um between both places and how immigration makes that hell um and then the second one briefly is about um my grandmother and thinking about all the things that my grandmother might know that i have no access to because of trauma perhaps um, and that I might never know, I'm trying to fill in the gaps about that, but also trying to channel the frustration I have with that. So it's a series of, um, of um, crossword puzzles um, made out of prose that I wrote about this situation, mm -hmm. um, where, you know, you, and it's, they're superimposed on top of images of archival images of my family. So while you're doing the word search, um, and it's a collaborative word search, so you do it on a big projector, like you know those old projectors, like from the schools, like yeah, with yeah. the plastic, <laughs> yeah, with the plastic, exactly on the on the plastic. Um, mm -hmm. So you do it on those. You could do it with a friend, but the the idea is that you spend time looking for the words, but you also start to spend time studying the images, the little bit, the images and the gaps between the letters, um, and trying to determine what is um, how to cope with that. How to, what to make of that kind of feeling of like bereftness mm -hmm. um but yeah okay and is your grandmother still with us yeah she's here 
Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, the information that you're looking for, because you said it might be because of trauma, why there are those gaps. Is there any um, physical reason why there's some information that you can't get, get in terms of like access to historical or ancestral information? Or is mm-hmm. it just the, through uh, the oral conversation or the oral storytelling why you're finding gaps? Yeah, yeah. I think that um, it's less physical. I think um, my family is very forthcoming with physical evidence, um, not evidence, but physical, you know, um, iterations of um, the past. Um, so I have a lot of images, um, but I think it's the oral histories that need to be recorded in some way. Um, my family is very good at, um, I don't know if they're, I don't think they're very much like, diaristic in that way but there's often writing that you can find if you look um so it might be things that indicate something is happening but it might not be a conscious meditation on an event if that makes sense yeah um but yeah um (laughs) sorry that kind of off a bit because i i feel like a lot of people will be able to resonate with the fact that we don't Mm -hmm have that we don't sit down and talk as much anymore Mm -hmm. um because I remember I used to spend some time with my grandma um she lived in another city on holidays Mm -hmm. but it wasn't until like after my mom died and my grandma started missing my mom where she started like Mm -hmm. really telling me stories you know Mm -hmm. so I definitely um I don't know why we (laughs) we don't have it as Culture. No, but it's, I I get that totally, you know. But you know, sometimes it's just like you're, you're a little bit fortunate because some of us don't get nothing. Mm-hmm. So, in this piece, in this iteration of the story, we start with a scene that feels like um, it purposely is forcing us to listen to your words. Um, mm-hmm. We because we have the caption on, on this version of film that I watched. I'm reading what you're saying, but I'm also looking at when you say we've seen this beach before and I'm just like, yes, mm. I am such a like fiend for a beach imagery <laughs> mm. <laughs> because living in Toronto, there is a no beach. So yeah. when you really pulled me back and I'm like, I can hear it, <laughs> yeah. but I can't see it. And I had to really listen to what you were saying. So how does this part of your prose actually speak to the perceptions that people have of our lands and our people some Mm -hmm. of of which we as Caribbean people also adapt Mm -hmm. so when I'm making things I'm very conscious of where the work will be shown right so I'm always just like well I'm making this however what are the chances that I show this at home as opposed to like in Trinidad as opposed to over here. I understand that most of my career is over here, so I'm speaking to double audiences here. So it's figuring out, for, for people in the Caribbean, we've seen this beach before because we know that beach. But for people in the US, I'm depriving you of that beach. Or in the Western yes. world, it's more like you can't have it, you already saw it, you know, it's like, how much do you want? But also like the beach as a yeah. metaphorical thing, as in the prose, like something that is, um, something that is the origin of things something that washes away things we are the beach all, we are the beach all the time historically when has the transatlantic slave trade ever stopped um so we're kind of living in the history of that sea mm-hmm. um so yeah basically and that's how it kind of shows up in the prose more or less yeah okay i see that because yeah. coming from a place of being hyper exposed to capitalism Mm -hmm. (laughs) i took it as like yes you're pulling you're holding this back from me but the reason that i associated to it was because whenever you look at my beach all you see is a way that you can not exploit but it's It's capitalism yeah Um no and it's also that for real because that's the same thing i'm talking about when i say like you know i'm thinking about my us audience or like my 
Western audience in general, Western, West of what, but like, yeah, West, you know what I mean? Um, my Western audience, because it's like, yeah, like I understand your um, perception of a Caribbean artist, what you think a Caribbean artist should be making work about and what you want to see in Caribbean art. And I'm here to tell you that I'm kind of not going to do it right now. I got that and I was like, okay, this is not going to be your typical piece of work. Yeah. Every beginning piece of mm-hmm. work. Um, not in the commercial sense anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, cool. So I wasn't too off on that. No, you wasn't off. No, 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 no. You wasn't off. Um, all right. So continuing to unpack some of the concepts because I felt like this was super high concept and you were letting us in to a very personal thing so Mm -hmm. like I said when we were talking earlier I'm gonna say some stuff and I and it's just my interpretation and I don't want to push my interpretation on you or my projections Mm -hmm. but um another thing that you did say in that first scene closer to the end was um we can take responsibility for the space and I'm always curious to know like what does that look like what does if we're talking about lineage and Caribbean-ness or even just heritage, what does taking responsibility of our space really look like to you? Mm-hmm. For me, taking responsibility of space is coming from looking at your lineage and identifying the cracks in it, but also identifying the really wholesome parts, right? Mm-hmm. And making sure that you are taking notes, you are not replicating what colonialism has wrought on us, which is lost histories all the time, trauma being passed on through ages. You're making sure that you're doing what people before you are unable to do. So it's not totally in the ether. You have some sort of agency in that. Yes, um, interpersonally, like, yes, capitalism is a thing. Yes, colonialism is a thing. Absolutely. However, in a peer-to-peer fashion within the home, it's for me, it starts within the home, just being able to um, record stories and being able to say, oh, I see that. Mm-hmm. Being able to provide evidence for people that come after you. So you're thinking about the violence that came before you, but also thinking about the violence you can prevent moving forward by making record of things, but by talking to people, by not replicating certain behaviors uh, mm-hmm. moving forward you know and also like inheriting like spiritual practices like the abandonment of certain spiritual practices um thinking that you could come how to come back into that now and how that might be uh more of a healing balm than anything else um that we've been taught or been taught to believe is um spiritually sound if anything um something beyond christianity you know yes and i feel like when we talk about that specifically in terms of the spiritual aspect i always think about our connection to our land that Mm -hmm. we were born on yes we were brought there but but i personally always feel a connection to jamaica like in terms of even I'll randomly have visions, like some memories, mm-hmm. and and I dream about Jamaica a lot. So like my, I feel attached, I guess, yeah. in a way more than just saying, "Oh, I love my country." You know, I think it's uh, the nature and like even exploring the non-urban parts of where we live can help us with that. Would you agree? Oh, definitely. Yeah, definitely. I feel like um, connection to land is so necessary to tap into those things. And, you know, it's funny because sometimes you would be like, oh, well, out here, like, we don't have the same foliage or flora. But I kind of like to think that um, through just the earth itself, like, we it provides like a pathway for meditation. So just sitting outside, taking your time, being with nature, trying to see where natural processes have continued to cycle on beyond us because mm-hmm. you know as you say that i'm also thinking about how um people talk about um the world is ending all the time but the world isn't really ending because people have known how to care for the land before capitalism people know how to do that well before so there's always a connection back to the land in that way um it's just um 
yeah, kind of trying to avoid eco-fascism, eco-fascism <laughs> when we talk about um, when we talk about um, the land. Um, but yeah, you definitely have to touch base with it. <laughs> you said it, or we see actually when you were. Um... I guess it's in the background we see on that that metal plate you have make the end you need the words and <laughs> I think it applies to so many areas of life mm-hmm. and even maybe for you it might be different each time you think about it but I just wanted to get a feeling for what were you what did it mean to you at that time when you were creating this piece? Yeah, at that time, um, it was really transformative for me to read that. So I read, that is um, a quote from um, N.K. Jemison. Um, she wrote the Broken Earth trilogy, um, really good sci-fi um, fantasy bit. <laughs> and at that time, I was thinking a lot about things that with like certain processes and organizations and ways of living within the art world in particular that I felt was like detrimental or feel as if is um kind of reductive in a particular type of way and wondering like what are ways that we can change this what are ways how much agency do we have in building like a new type of art world but then tandem at the same time thinking about my family and thinking about the fact that I don't have to do what they do ever so you know like i if i if the idea is that one wants to see um some sort of new world in which particular things are happening then you have to do it yeah and it's 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 a small it feels like um it feels herculean it feels like very big but like Mm -hmm. it's like thinking about the small ways every day that you can live out the things that you want to see thinking about the ways that you relate to other people, thinking about how you relate to the earth, how you can do that differently, how you relate to spirituality, how you relate to the people around you, and like making it your business to do it differently um, so that you get the ending you need. And it may not even be in this lifetime. It might even be in the, after this lifetime because that's the work, right? You might not even see what the work that you've done benefits, how it benefits your kids and your kids' kids and your kids' kids' kids. Like, right. So, yeah. And I think that intentionality is, it's not, it's not easy Mm -hmm. because of how we've been, I hate using this word, but programmed Mm -hmm. to, to just survive, not even live, Mm -hmm. (laughs) to survive. Would you say that making the end that you need doing being that intentional requires some kind of slowness oh yeah yeah that's something i've been thinking about a lot recently is um how strange a relationship the time is mm-hmm. um I, it definitely requires slowness and understanding that slowness is necessary and sometimes slowness is the only option um when we kind of exactly like sometimes when we measure like progress narratives and we think about progress all the time it's always just like progress is fast progress requires that we move quickly um and streamlined and is very efficient but this is not that that Mm -hmm. is it feels like a very capitalist mode of thinking so it's like literally living your life in a non-capitalist way or trying to think past that in a lot of ways while still paying your bills (laughs) while still paying your bills and the thing is people you know that's the thing too like figuring out how to be at peace with yourself about the fact that there are compromises you make Mm -hmm. to live every day but also you know that you're doing these small things every day to shift that you're stealing away time stealing away resources towards something else um but yeah it's so slow and i feel like um yeah we're just not very much taught that um slowness is sometimes inevitable and necessary Uh Uh, yeah because even when i think about health i'm just like okay Mm -hmm. if you don't slow down (laughs) your body's gonna do it for you and absolutely learn that so in such heart violent (laughs) way Mm -hmm. um absolutely yeah okay so let's move on to talk about um 
the weight we put on our ancestors to be wise for us. Mm -hmm. I'm definitely paraphrasing something that you said in the piece, mm -hmm. but to, to be wise for us or be our teachers. And I'm not necessarily talking about only the people that we we've met in this lifetime, but collective ancestry. Mm -hmm. I think black people are talking about this a lot now, where it's just like my ancestors, this, my ancestors, that, and we're really trying to learn about spirituality and tapping into um, the ways that we can connect with our ancestors, but something might be, I don't know if something's lost, but can we just talk about yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, how heavy that is? Yeah, no, you know, something about that, what, what I was really thinking about when I was um, writing that is largely that, you know, we deny the fullness of, um, we deny the fullness of um, an experience to like a lived experience of our ancestors all the time when you know you idealize them as these people who have transcended and learned the lessons that they've needed to learn sometimes your ancestors are not really not not all of your ancestors are on your side ah okay um as sometimes you know not all of them are bene benevolent spirits often and i think that that gets lost in the source or we don't give ancestors room to show us what the entire life was like you don't yeah. like like you don't become like um like your sins aren't erased from the time you do that and the lessons that they can teach is probably coming from often from the fact that they have done things in their lived life and have learned from that but also keeping in mind that some people just are probably are not it some yeah. people are just not and to be mindful of how much weight we put on them because also when so I think about sometimes, sometimes I always just wonder, like, are we binding them to this plane mm. by often like asking things and re relying on things like, you know, you could always call on them. However, like where we call and for what often I wonder if like, sometimes I wonder if like they have a relationship to rest and labor similarly to us, where it's just like, wow, I'm dead. I would like to rest on you. Why you keep calling my line? Yeah. Stop calling me. I'm good. You're calling me for all kinds of things. Blow out the candle. I don't want to be here right now. <laughs> like, I so never I, even thought of that. Yeah. So I wonder, like, I, I, when I think about it, I'm just like, I hope my ancestors are taking a nap. Like, I, I, I don't want you to be caught coming out here 24 7. Um, but thanks for looking out, I guess. But, <laughs> you know, so, yeah. yeah. Uh, you're messing with me right now because I'm like, do I be bothering my mother? <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't know until they ask. Hmm. Mm. Okay, thank you for that. <laughs> wow. Yes, because we, we love to say R.I.P., R.I.P., but are we letting them rest in peace, though? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Oh, man, that's interesting. Okay. All right, so... One of my favorite scenes visually of your whole piece was, I don't know if it's the mirrors, I don't know what it is, but when mm. you were playing with the light in the broken uh, mirror um, and it was flashing dark, then back to light so you could actually see the reflections, but then it kind of went away. And to me, that felt like some kind of portal. And I was like, mm -hmm. is this a portal? Is it not? Let me know if I'm off. Mm -hmm. No, I'm always thinking about portals when I'm making this. It's um, kind of why I'm very much into like um, reflex, um, reflective surfaces mm -hmm. uh, and the kind of doorways they can be. But I think specifically what I was thinking about with the mirrors in general was, um, you know, in, in some spiritualities, there's um, something called scrying. Um, scrying is a method of like seeing into the past, present and or future. Like you could spy on somebody by using like, a medium such as like a mirror and or like elemental things you can use fire to scry you can use ice to scry water you can see into the past or the what somebody else is doing now or into the future so thinking about that in conversation with um my family history and wondering like what would it be like to be making my own sort of future what would it be like to be making my own type of future what would that look like and realizing that there's no blueprint for that. The idea of that is always changing. So looking into that portal might not even make sense at this point. 
Okay. So because it's always changing as one grows. So yeah, it's a portal, but <laughs> it's a temporary portal. Okay, got you. And any significance to that one that we saw being broken, or am I just deeping it? Mm, no, nothing. In, um, nothing in particular. It's just like a a divorcing of the self, I think, from the idea that there is um, sort of like a linear path to follow, um, mm-hmm. and that one, you know, one has to do some sort of work. And then also like just the breaking up, you know, speaks to like the multiplicity of the self. Yes. as well so like yeah <laughs> all right thank you <laughs> i am just like a nerd for like all of these things i'm like tell me no. all the symbols and signs that you put in your work girl because no. <laughs> <laughs> i feel like when when we get a piece of work like this that it's not like super narrative heavy and we're not just focused on people and story and things it really allows me as a consumer, as a viewer, mm-hmm. uh, to f- not just find meaning, but reflect on myself. Because as I'm finding meaning to your work, I'm like, but suppose that's not what the girl mean, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I'm just like, so it makes me think about why did I assign that specific meaning to your work? So that's kind of why I'm just like, I want to know what you thought because this is what I thought. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's also like really important to me that people are able to make those associations, right? Um, Something for me with signs is always just like making sure that people are able to like, wait, okay, why did I think that? Mm -hmm. Um, Because I feel as, you know, it feels like a simple question, but it isn't actually. There's so many things that we do that are unquestioned. Like, why am I drawn to X? Why am I drawn to Y? Why am I repulsed by X? Why am I repulsed by Y? And then you have to sit down and think about it. Yes, and we're going to talk about repulsion right now, because you started talking about spiders and my brain immediately wanted to check out. I'm like, why? Why we got to go there? (laughs) Oh, Lord. (laughs) But I'm glad that you did, because something that you did say is my final thought Mm -hmm. is you said you are talking about not killing the spiders and that whole like letting them be in their corner and Mm -hmm. all of that stuff and then you said perhaps I'll leave it alone as long as it remembers itself and doesn't sprawl Mm -hmm. and my brain as someone being exposed to so much like decolonization conversations and a lot of like issues in the news and on Twitter and everywhere that is talking about the Black experience immediately mm-hmm. like, but wait that's mm-hmm. how white people see us mm-hmm. they'll leave us in our corner as long as we're not t- coming out of our britches, we know our place mm-hmm. we remember ourselves, how they see us, so again, yeah, no. I don't know if that's what you were going for, but that's what I, I found, so can you talk about no. that, that um, prose? No, I, I actually, I've never heard it read like that before. So I didn't read it like that. I, I was, I'm, I'm actually kind of like, huh, interesting. So now I'm thinking about like how we kind of like embody certain things. How we come to, um, how we learn in our body how to replicate violence, mm-hmm. you know, um, to snuff something out if it moves. I'm wondering if that is all like a lay, like some layovers you know, from being taught that, like, it's very human-centric, you know what I mean? It's very human-centric, where it's just kind of like, humans are these species, they are the one, however, the idea of human doesn't even include Black people to begin with, Hmm. so why am I reproducing that (laughs) with um, non-human, non-human subjects, non-human people, and thinking about it in terms of metaphor, like, yeah, it's embodied, like, how one might show dominance over non-human species and yeah I think that's something to think about like I'm I'm, I'm about to work through that now so thanks for that <laughs> no problem but yeah. what where um were you just what were you thinking at the time though at the time at the time I, I don't think I I was I think I was thinking about um the fact that you know that I was coming to terms with the fact that I I'm not going to be going home into Trinidad anytime soon at that point in time. 
coming to terms with the fact that um, I really do want to have space to myself. However, you know, one's access to resources to have things for that very limited due to a variety of factors that I'm sure you know about. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, I'm just thinking about scarcity in that way and how does one hold on to what they have. But then it's also like thinking about being nomadic Uh at the same time and having to rebuild your home every single time Uh thinking about how your home is susceptible to factors beyond you so thinking through how spiders you know they will build something and you know you leave them (laughs) and we march over and bust it open and it's just like okay like did i build again like did i dream too big okay (laughs) like (laughs) so yeah just thinking about things like that you know Mm -hmm. like um yeah and even space as you're talking i'm just like space is costly Mm -hmm. not necessarily always in dollars but in when you're talking about rebuilding because i would love to have a nomadic lifestyle but you're right it you're and i mean there's excitement in starting Mm -hmm. sometimes but you it depends on again your resources if you have the resources if you're well resourced you can be nomadic with comfort and ease but if you're not it's a bigger feat i guess Mm -hmm. exactly to have home base is a privilege yeah 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 Yeah. especially right now for (laughs) a lot of people Mm -hmm. wow okay well that's all i had (laughs) okay (laughs) we done (laughs) we done okay good i hope this was fun for you i hope yeah yeah definitely full nerd mode Um, all right so thank you kiara for spending some time with me today and allowing me to pick apart your work and thanks for watching julie mango tv subscribe for more conversations with caribbean filmmakers and creators i'm rich osborne and we'll see you next time